Welcome to the uh, biophysical and physical biology seminar series. Uh, today, we're, it's our pleasure to have uh, Cindy Tang and David Sivak. And uh, our first talk is Cindy Tang um, from Stanford, who's going to tell us about microfluidic platforms uh, for studying single cell wound repair. And we're, it, uh, we're really excited to hear from you. And so, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, it says uh, the whole uh, the sharing has not been enabled yet. Okay, so we'll we'll take one more minute while Cindy is we work out our Zoom. Uh, it should work now. Okay. Okay, can you see? We can see. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so let me move my screens around. Okay. Okay. I think this is good. All right. So you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, all right. So thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. I'm very excited to be here with you today and share with you some of the work from our lab. Now, many of you know that uh, wounding occurs at the tissue level like paper cut. But what is less known is that wounding can also occur at the single cell level where the plasma membrane is compromised. As it turns out, uh, single cell wounding is quite common. It can happen just from routine mechanical wear and tear. And it's relevant to many diseases uh, such as cardiac disease, muscular dystrophy, and even cancer metastasis. Now, for those of you who know about tissue level wound healing, which is often achieved by generating new cells to replace the ones that were lost at the wound site. This strategy may not work for single cells as you may not have neighboring cells to help you out. In single cells, I'd like to think of it like Apollo 13 in space. If there is a hole in the spacecraft, you may not have anyone around to help you and you're pretty much on your own to fix the hole or you die. So, Coming to this problem as an engineer, it allows us to ask questions that may not be typically asked by biologists. So the first question that we ask is, when there is a wound, how long does the cell have to fix it? So without any biological background myself and without doing any experiments, we thought, well, why don't we do some rough back of envelope estimations? So the first estimation we did was to see how long it may take for stuff to spill out of the cell when there is a wound. So we estimated that if there is a wound size that is about 10% of cell size, it's uh, the leakage rate can be up to one to 80% of the cell volume per second. Now this sounds really fast. So we tried another approach, which is to look at the diffusion of calcium in, into the cell. And calcium is always uh, is mostly toxic to the cell. So by looking at the diffusion time and a cell size that's about 10 microns, we estimated that the diffusion time is also on the order of one to 10 seconds. Now, even though this is a very rough estimate, uh, it actually agrees quite well with experimental values. And uh, in a range of uh, different cell types, it was found that the, uh, the healing time is on the order of one to 10 seconds. So the bottom line is uh, wound healing occurs on the order of seconds and not hours or days. And this is really important because it tells us that the tools or the instruments that we develop and use should have a timing resolution that is better than seconds in order to capture the dynamics. Now there have been quite a few studies on uh, wound healing a lot of them were done in Sanopus oocytes. And from these studies, it's found that when there is a wound, uh, the influx of calcium and or uh, oxidative species will trigger uh, the uh, wound response to get started. And once it's started, uh, there are a few different mechanisms that have been reported. And one of them is a contraction of the cytoskeleton like actomyosin to kind of close in on the wound. And once that happens, there's also the patching of the membrane hole by fusion of the internal vesicle membranes with the mass plasma membrane. And there are quite a few more that have been studied and reported. So this is a, a relatively simple picture 
but there is still a lot that is still unknown and there are still quite a few uh, 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 unanswered questions. For example, the detailed mechanism of wound healing is still not quite fully uh, elucidated. And the other question is, what makes the cell decide to heal or die? And also uh, what makes some cells more ready to heal than others? So all these are not quite fully explored yet. So in our study, uh, we use uh, Stantor ceruleus as our model organism. Uh, Stantor is the giant single cell cilia that is free living and can extend up to a millimeter in length. And it was first introduced to us by Wallace Marshall at UCSF. Now, what is amazing about Stantor is that it can heal really drastic wounds. As early as 1901, Thomas Morgan reported that uh, he can cut the uh, Stantor cell into many small pieces. And one thing special about Stantor is that it has uh, many nuclear nodes. And as long as the fragment has some DNA, uh, Morgan found that the fragment can heal the wound and also eventually regenerate into a full organism. Now, when I first heard about this uh, from Wallace, which is uh, almost a decade ago at Woodshow, I was totally fascinated. I thought, wow, this is like the holy grail of engineering and material science. It's like you can break this computer in two and you get two functional computers. So I thought I got to study this. Now, of course, more fundamentally, there's the question of how does the single cell know what is lost and remember what to repair and regenerate. Now, as exotic as Stanter sounds, it's now possible to study Stanter because of the work from Wallace and quite a few many others now. The, the genome of Stanter is, uh, has been reported and described by Wallace's group, and they also show that it's possible to do RNAi by feeding Stanter bacteria. So even though uh, the molecular tools are now ready, uh, there is one thing missing. So the current way of wounding single cell is still manual and slow. This picture shows you the micro section apparatus that was used to wound single cells uh, back in 1918, reported by Robert Chambers. It consists of a simple microscope, a translucent stage that holds a micropipette that has been sharpened to form a needle uh, to position over the cell to cut it or wound it. Now, fast forward to 2013, this is the double-decker microscope developed that was home marine biology, uh, the physiology course. Now, you can see that the microscope and the camera are now much more advanced, but it still requires a student to position a needle directly over the cell in order to wound it. And the problem with this method is, of course, that it's not that fast. If you have exactly the right dose of caffeine, it can take three minutes to cut just one cell. Now for many experiments like RNA-seq, it can require hundreds of cells to collect just enough material for analysis. So at this rate of three minutes per cell, it would take five hours to cut a hundred cells, assuming you only have one student cutting the cells one at a time. If you remember the wound healing time was on the order of one to 10 seconds, so in five hours, we would have lost all the interesting dynamics. Now, in addition to being slow, manual cutting is also imprecise. And this is the famous, we call it Stanter Terminator movie that was taken when the student is trying to cut the cell on the double-decker microscope. So as you can see, this is when we're trying to poke the cell and wound it, and it's a little bit uh, messy, and you, as you can imagine, it is also difficult to position the needle precisely and control the position of the wound as well as the size of the wound. Now, coming to this problem, uh, I, more than almost 10 years ago when I first uh, found out about uh, this, uh, this uh, interesting problem, so I thought, well, what if we just automate and shrink the, micro, the, the guillotine so of course, we're not cutting any humans. So we're gonna be replacing a human with Stanter cell. And we're gonna replace the operators with a fluidic conveyor belt because Stanters are living in aqueous media. 
And finally, instead of having a knife that will come down and chop off the head, we'll replace with a fixed knife and deliver the center cell using the fluidic conveyor belt to the knife. So that becomes our microfluidic guillotine. And the geometry is actually very simple. It consists of just one channel that splits into two that bisects the cell. We have a continuous flow to deliver the cell continuously to the knife. We have a channel that is slightly narrower than the cell diameter to provide the confinement. And it also allows the automatic alignment of the cell to the knife. We have a knife that's made of PDMS, which is an elastomeric silicone rubber. Uh, we were actually uh, a little surprised that it was able to cut stanter. And we think that this is possible because stanter is much softer than PDMS. It's kind of like cutting chicken with plastic knife. As long as the chicken is softer than your plastic, then you can cut it. And finally, we have these shunts to equalize the pressure downstream in order to ensure that the cuts are even. So in this case, we can get an equal bisection of the cell. So we cut a bunch of these cells and we looked at them right after, and we can see that uh, the membrane is indeed uh, ripped apart, exposing the cytoplasm. So you can see that this darker area is the membrane and the lighter area is exposed uh, cytosol. So we're able to cut a bunch of cells and we found that 97% of the cell fragments were able to heal and survive. And in fact, by three to four hours, the cells have already sealed the wounds and also start to regenerate this trumpet shape that's very typical for Stanter. So now that we show we can cut a bunch of cells without killing them immediately, the next question we ask is, how fast can we cut the cells in the microfluidic guillotine? So this movie shows you uh, the cutting process at a relatively low flow rate. And you can see that the cut is clean. The cell can mostly survive uh, in this regime. But when we crank up the flow rate uh, up to 8.5 centimeters per second, you can see that the cell is now severely deformed and extended. There is significant cytosol spilling and most of the cases, the cells actually do not survive. So obviously there's some kind of cutoff when we increase the flow rate. So the next thing we did is we vary the flow rate from low to high and basically measure how much the cell is deformed or extended. And we're able to classify the cutting into two regimes, uh, regime one at low flow rate, where the cell is mildly deformed and is cut cleanly and has high survival rate. And in regime two, where the flow rate is higher and the cell is severely deformed uh, with significant cytoplasm spilling and much lower survival rate. So now we're still studying the detailed physics of cutting of stanter in our microfluid and guillotine. But interestingly, we found quite a lot of similarity with the cutting of the elastic droplet which tells us that maybe uh, we can model Stanter cell as some viscoelastic media. So probably the characterization of the regime one to regime two transition is helpful because it can tell us the maximum rate that we can run the guillotine at. Because the cell survival drops dramatically transitioning from regime one to regime two, it tells us that the maximum cutting throughput we can get without killing most of the cells is in a single guillotine, it's right at a cutoff between regime one and regime two, which is about one to two centimeters per second. I'll come back to this later. The next problem that we came upon is that cell debris also builds up on the blade during the cut. So in the first cut, you can see that the blade is clean and the cut is clean. But by the fifth cut or even the 10th cut, the cell residue builds up so much in the blade that it eventually clogs the channel and we cannot cut anymore. So this is a big issue if we wanna cut hundreds of cells because obviously we cannot cut more than 10 here. Uh, but luckily, uh, another part of my lab works on droplet microfluidics and we're able to address this problem by putting the cell inside a water droplet that is suspended in an immiscible oil phase. 
the surface tension between water and oil was actually sufficient enough uh, to grab whatever cell residue that was left over on the blade and remove it from the blade and provide the self-cleaning purpose. So by using droplets, it allows us to use the same guillotine many times, cut many cells without having to worry about the fouling of the blade. So finally, we can put everything together. Although for a single guillotine, we cannot cut much faster than a centimeter per second, we can, over the, we can overcome that quite easily in microfluidics by just putting a bunch of these guillotines in parallel. So here I show you uh, the schematic of a parallel, eight of these guillotines in parallel integrated with droplet generators to put the standard cells inside the droplets. And with this uh, uh, approach and design, we're able to get a cutting throughput that was uh, already 200 times faster than cutting by hand. And in a single experiment, we can cut more than 100 cells quite easily. And we're able to maintain close to 100% survival of the cells. And for this design, it was sufficient uh, for most of our initial experiments. Now, it turns out uh, our guillotine is also useful for cutting not just single cells, but also multicellular structures like organoids. And this work is with the Wendell Lim group at UCSF. And you can see that we have basically the same geometry of the guillotine. And all we had to do is to scale the size of the guillotine so that it will fit the size of the organoid to still provide the confinement. And we're able to bisect it successfully and subsequently study the regeneration of the internal structure of the organoid. Okay, now that uh, we can cut cells in a high throughput manner, the next question we ask is, how long does Stantra take to repair its wounds? So typically we'll do life imaging of the membrane to see when it closes. Unfortunately, uh, no membrane dyes have worked for Stantra quite yet. And I'd love to talk to you if you have ideas for what might work for Stantra. But in the meantime, we decided uh, to do an indirect assay to measure the membrane integrity by using a membrane permeable dye cytox screen. So cytox screen is not fluorescent until it's inside the cell and associates with nucleic acids. So we thought we could use it to figure out whether the cell still has a wound or not, uh, which will allow the cytox screen to diffuse in. So the assay is relatively simple. It contains a guillotine, uh, we change the cell incubation time to let it heal for different time uh, durations. And then we fix it and then incubate in cytox screen and then we image it. And as you can imagine, if the cell is not wounded or has healed its wound completely, it will be dark and we cannot see any fluorescence. But if there's a still a wound, uh, there's fluorescence uh, lighting up and we can see that in the, in the graph here. And by using a threshold uh, fluorescence, we can differentiate cells that are still wounded versus those that are healed. And using this approach, we're able to characterize the wound healing time for Stantor. And you can see that uh, they take on the order of 100 to 1,000 seconds to completely heal, which is longer than what I had uh, talked about earlier, which is on the order of tens of seconds. And we think that might be because Stantor is much bigger, it's like 100 to 200 micron, like 10 times bigger than the cell size that we studied previously. Um, the other thing that you'll notice that uh, regime two cells take much longer to heal than regime one cells, which is reasonable because regime two, the wounds are much more, uh, much bigger and more severe. So uh, we then looked at uh, Stantor during the repair process, and we identified three really interesting distinct mechanical modes of wound repair that were not reported before. So the first was uh, contraction we found that the cell can contract around the wound site, almost like a Pac-Man closing its mouth to just close in uh, on the wound. The second uh, mode was cytoplasm retrieval. And we found that uh, when their cytoplasm spell out, the cell can sometimes suck it back into the cell. And the third one is twisting and pulling. So if you remember, uh, uh, Stantor is ciliated and it's a very strong swimmer. 
And we found that uh, sometimes when the cell plasma is so spilled out that it's somehow the, uh, the cell decided it's not no longer retrievable, it will amputate itself by twisting around the wound site to both close the wound and also to escape from this lost cytoplasm. And interestingly, it is quite similar to what is called the rotokinesis in tetrahymena cell division. So it's possible that the mechanisms here are quite similar. Now, the next question we ask is uh, what drives these uh, mechanical mode of repair? So uh, Stanter is a strong swimmer, uses cilia. So the first thing we did was to inhibit the cilia with nickel chloride. So this movie shows you a really beautiful uh, a movie of uh, the cilia beating. And when we incubate it in nickel chloride, and this movie is already showing, it's not just a static picture because you can see the timestamp, the nickel chloride is barely beating at all. And you can see very similar results by just looking at the chymographs and the 2D autocorrelations. So for the, un uh, for the control cells that are untreated, uh, the, the seal is beating very regularly and you can characterize the frequency and the velocity of the beat. But in nickel chloride, there's ba barely any motion. So uh, we looked at the time scale for the repair or the, uh, for the response for the different modes of uh, responses uh, for contractions, that plus some retrieval and twisting and pulling. And when we uh, compare that with the nickel chloride treatment where the cilia is uh, uh, inhibited, as you can imagine and expect uh, the twisting and pulling mode, if it happens, it takes much longer. Whereas the other two modes are barely affected. So this is totally uh, consistent with our expectation because nickel chloride uh, suppresses cilia motion. So uh, it just tells us that cilia is indeed important for the twisting or pulling mode of wound repair in Stanter. Now, the next thing that we look at is myonemes. So myonemes are uh, responsible for contraction and Stanter and quite a few other cilia when they're disturbed. So we went on to inhibit the myonemes with potassium iodide or Ki. So this movie shows you that a normal center, once you touch it, it will quickly contract, and that's from myonine. But once it's incubated in KI, uh, it's been kind of moved around by the needle, but it barely does any uh, uh, contraction. However, we find that uh, in KI, uh, the cilia is still somewhat beating uh, roughly at a, a similar frequency and velocity as uh, the unwounded uh, control, even though you can see a little bit of lack of coordination here. So when we look at the time scale of uh, 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 the, pro the different processes, uh, we would expect that for, uh, for this, uh, the cells that are treated with KI, the contraction mode might be affected. But when we looked at the data, we we're surprised to find that there is very little difference in uh, the time scale for these different processes uh, for the KI treated cells versus the controls. So this is surprising and we're still trying to understand more about the mechanisms, but it tells us that the myoneme contraction only plays a relatively minor role here. So, um, so what, what we have learned so far, right? So first we show that uh, Stanter takes 100 to 1,000 seconds to repair the bisection wounds. And again, this is larger than uh, what we uh, looked at uh, in the other cells, and probably because Stanter is much bigger, so it can probably tolerate a much longer healing time. And in addition, Stanter has these uh, contractile vacuoles that can pump water out, so that might help it survive for longer uh, when the wound is not closed yet. But um, even this... Sorry, you have two minutes left. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, and um, But even this looks uh, like a long time, uh, the wound sizes that we are creating with the microfluidic vehicle is actually quite big. So if you compare just the wound healing rate uh, with uh, for center and a range of other cells, it's actually among the highest in terms of the wound healing rate, uh, orders of magnitude higher than most of the other cells that are in mammalian systems. So the second thing that we learned is that large scale mechanical behavior may be more important in center wound healing and maybe other single cell free living system uh, wound healing than previously thought. And we have identified three different modes like contraction, surplus and retrieval, twisting and pulling. So uh, that's uh, closing uh, my talk, so, but there are still many unanswered questions. 
such as the physics of cell cutting, what are the detailed physical and biological pathways of healing, like what is the minimum set of components needed to heal, and what makes the cell decide to heal versus to die. Uh, and uh, there's also the million dollar question, how does the cell remember what is lost and regenerate? Are there similarities between single cell and multi-cell wound healing? And also if we understand all this, might this provide new opportunities for therapeutics? So with that, I'd like to end my talk and thank you all of you for your attention and also my students, especially Kevin, Luke, Raj and Adrian for that wonderful work uh, to make it possible. And also Wallace Marshall, of course, and Wendell Lim, this collaborator who inspired us uh, to start this work to start with. And uh, finally, just a little ad, um, looking for postdoc in a different project of microfluidics and immunology and food allergy. So feel free to email me, uh, my contact is here. And uh, I'd love to talk to you more about any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy, for an awesome talk. And we have uh, quite a few questions. And so I'll just start with an early question that you sort of, uh, that, that you've uh, adjust a little bit uh, where when you talked about cytoplasm retrieval, but somebody asked, Ashok Prasad asked, if you cut the cell in half, are you basically losing all the liquid in the cytoplasm within seconds? And Meredith uh, later followed up uh, asking about uh, the cytoplasm retrieval also um, and, and wondered if it was related to eating. To eating? Yeah, like oh. I think cell, so, like maybe endocytosis or something. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so the first question. So we're actually also surprised that when we cut uh, bisect the cell in the guillotine, it does not immediately, the cellplasm doesn't immediately spill out. In fact, I think that has to do with the fine physics of how the knife is interacting with the cell as we cut it. So in regime one, we think that the wound is possibly pretty small because the cell kind of wraps around the blade first and then pinch off at the very end. So the wound is actually smaller than it might look. So it's not like a watermelon, like you cut it in half and expose half of it. But instead it's like, um, like almost like a curtain that wraps around and then eventually sort of pinches off, leaving a relatively small wound. Uh, but in regime two is completely different because it's so uh, sheared and deformed. So the wounds are much bigger. Um, so yeah, so so I guess the, the long, um, the, the short answer is that no, it doesn't immediately spill out and lose half of it. Um, at least, so we're looking at only the, the repair of half of the cell and the wound for that half of the cell is not that big. Um, and then the other question is the cell person retrieval like eating. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, the question we, we were wondering is whether it's similar to like flapping and how like the cell was somehow able to form a membrane really quickly on the exposed cytoplasm and then use uh, a mechanism that might be similar to blabbing to reduce it, but we don't really know yet. Uh, that's something that we're still, uh, that's actually very uh, recent where we just submitted the, the, this work on bioarchive. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out what is going on molecularly. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Ford asked a question on, on a more, more about the, the experimental setup. She asked, uh, if you change the water droplet size, which the cells are encapsulate, encapsulated in, uh, how, how does the confinement of the droplet affect uh, your results? Like, does it influence the extension of the cell? Yeah, so it is the confinement of the channel that matters the most. Uh, the droplet is deformable, right? So the droplet can be very long, uh, but as long as the channel is uh, is uh, narrower than the cell, then it will be it will be confined. Uh, I don't know if there's an easy way to go back to that slide. Uh, yeah, so you can see that here the droplet is actually quite big, uh, but because it's deformable, so it takes up the width of the channel itself. So uh, at the end, it's really the width of the channel that matters and govern the confinement. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Eric Dufresne asks a question about if. Uh, if, if we know how the composition and properties of the center membrane and its associated cytoskeleton, um, uh, uh, let's see, I think I read the question wrong. He said, what do we know about the composition of and properties of the center membrane and its associated cytoskeleton or paracellular matrix? Um, and he wondered, uh, uh, he followed up with a question that 
I have lost, uh, where he was um, asking about how you've talked about uh, how the actomyosin contractility can help uh, close the membrane, um, but he wonders how that works when the membrane is fluid. Yeah, so uh, maybe Wallace, I don't, I don't know if he's still here, uh, can comment on this. I don't, uh, I, as, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, there's not much known about the membrane composition of center, but we do know that there are probably alveolar sacs, which are little sacs that right underneath the membrane that are calcium reserves that might help uh, 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 center in its rapid uh, wound response. And uh, in terms of the actomyosin, so we were thinking about that. But, um, but uh, there are some early work looking at the anat anatomy of center, and I didn't really quite find actin uh, in the um, uh, close to the, the membrane. But there is actin somewhere in center, it's just we don't quite know what is its role. And, uh, and the contractile fibers uh, that uh, show you the myelin are actually the ones that were uh, found uh, right next to the uh, microtubule bundles that are uh, in the cortex of the cell. So we are still not sure if the cell is using uh, something similar to actomyosin per string uh, closing uh, in, in center yet. Uh, we haven't seen signs of it, uh, but that's something that we're uh, definitely looking at uh, right now, but haven't really found any conclusive answers. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks again for a, a really interesting talk and bringing microfluidics to, our, uh, to the BPP seminars.